Thank you, and um, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to be here today. It's really a great pleasure to be able to come out here to visit. Um, I'm opening here with an image of the gamma ray sky from Fermi. And the purpose of the talk today is going to be on one area of this uh, image, specifically here, right near the galactic center, where for some time now there's been um, observation of an excess of GEV gamma rays, and it's caused a considerable amount of excitement um, because it could possibly be interpreted as a dark matter annihilation signal. What I'm going to be discussing today is a, a new analysis of uh, this excess that's essentially trying to characterize how clumpy the photons in the excess look. Um, the general formalism philosophy for the analysis was laid out in this paper from last December with Samuel Lee and Ben Safdie. And um, the data analysis came out just a few weeks ago um, in this paper with uh, Samuel Lee, Ben Safdie, Tracy Slater, and Wei Zwei. So indirect detection provides a very promising avenue for dark matter discovery. For these types of searches, we're looking for dark matter that's annihilating um, to produce standard model final states. If the annihilation goes directly into photons, such as in this case here, then we expect to see um, a, a line in the photon energy spectrum uh, of all of the photons that, that we're observing, where the location of the line is, uh, the energy of the line is given by the mass of the dark matter. In the case where the dark matter annihilates to other standard model states like the W, the Z, or some quark, um, these states will shower, they'll hadronize, and produce photons in that shower. Um, so you lose some information in that showering process, and essentially the uh, the excess of photons that we would observe would be a continuum. So no longer a line, but you would still see um, uh, an excess above the expected background. Now, the Fermi Large Area Telescope is, at the moment, one of the best probes for high energy gamma rays from dark matter annihilation. It was launched in June of 2008. Um, it scans the sky, roughly the whole sky, every three hours and is sensitive to a very wide range of energies, so from down to 20 MeV all the way up to um, even a little bit greater than 300 GeV. So this here is um, an image uh, showing the photons observed by Fermi in the inner galaxy. So each panel here is spanning plus or minus 20 degrees on uh, each axis here around the center of the galaxy. Um, the galactic plane is masked, so everything that's dark black is just masked. Um, and each panel here is showing photons in a different energy range. So you can see the first one here is 0.5 to 1 GeV, 1 to 3 GeV, this is 3 to 10, and 10 to 5. Uh, in all the panels, you see that there's a brighter uh, bright spot near, closer to the galactic center. However, you should note that the scales are different in each of the panels. So um, in particular here, the scale goes up to 20, whereas here it's just above 4, and here it's just above 1.5. So the excess that um, has been observed is mainly dominated by photons in the 1 to 3 GeV uh, region. Um, you can see that it extends uh, fairly um, high above the plane, and in particular, it goes up roughly 10 degrees above the galactic center. Um, the amount of photons that are observed is about 10% of the total flux observed in this region of the sky. Um, this is not a statistical fluctuation. There's a lot of photons that are there. Um, there's been considerable study of this excess um, and convergence on the fact that uh, there certainly is a, um, more photons here than we know how to explain. Um, the question has really come down to whether or not, um, you know, how large the systematic uncertainties are. This area of the sky um, has a lot of, astro, you know, a lot of astrophysics going on. Um, trying to characterize the systematic uncertainties from those astrophysical backgrounds is um, it's a big task and is really kind of the main thing that we need to get under control before we can um, really uh, get at the heart of what's going on here. So this is showing the energy spectrum for the photons in this excess. You can see that it peaks roughly around um, slightly below 2 GeV or so. Um, the 
Excess is fit, so the, the data points are shown here, and then the, the solid line is the fit. Um, this is a, assuming um, dark matter annihilation and uh, uh, an NFW profile for the dark matter density distribution. Um, in general, the morphology of the signal is actually consistent with what you would expect for dark matter annihilation. It's spherically symmetric. It's centered on, the, on Sagittarius A. Um, and like I said, the density fall off of the, uh, the intensity fall off of the excess is consistent with um, what we expect from n body dark matter simulations uh, for the dark matter case. Now, the biggest issue is um, whether or not this might be coming from um, uh, diffuse emission from, uh, let's say, cosmic rays in the center of the galaxy. Um, this paper, which came out uh, last year, was um, looking at what happens when you varied over a wide range of possible models for the diffuse emission. Um, and in all cases, they ended up finding that there was still evidence for an excess. Um, essentially, the models sort of spanned anywhere between the uh, dotted lines here. So the dotted lines are an envelope uh, of all of the, the spectra that they picked out with these different diffuse models. So it does seem like the signal is uh, fairly robust to um, this, the, the modeling of the diffuse background. Um, and this is just showing what the best fit dark matter candidate is. So um, if you have dark matter annihilation to BB bar, uh, the signal is best fit by roughly a 30 GeV uh, dark matter mass and thermal, close to thermal annihilation cross-section. And all of the different studies that have been done um, tend to find values that are very close to this. So that's fairly consistent. Um, and then this is the fit for the, um, inner the slope of the inner profile for the dark matter density. Again, uh, consistent with uh, results from n-body simulations. Now, because this signal is so intriguing and has um, potentially uh, extremely important implications for dark matter, um, it's very important to consider all possible explanations for it. Um, one alternative explanation that's really going to form the, the heart of the talk, my talk today, is whether or not the excess can arise from a population of unresolved point sources uh, in this region of the sky. And so in particular, what I want to do is present a model-independent way of testing this hypothesis, which takes advantage of photon count statistics. So to just kind of give you some intuition for what I mean by photon count statistics, um, I want to start with a... a just a toy uh, example. So here, shown here, is uh, just some Monte Carlo of what the best fit dark matter signal would look like. So this is our 30 GV candidate. It annihilates to BB bar. And uh, shown here, 20 degrees by 20 degrees. Here's the galactic center. Um, I haven't superimposed any backgrounds or anything here. This is just the dark matter signal. This is what a collection of point sources might look like, um, where we've chosen the spatial distribution of the, the point sources to fall off um, in intensity in the same way that you would expect the NFW uh, um, for an NFW density distribution. Um, and so there's, there's a few things you could probably see just by eye here that are similarities, a few things that are clearly different. So for example, in both cases, the, the distribution is fairly spherically symmetric. Um, the fall off is the same relative in radius from the galactic center. But then there's obvious differences. So for example, the point sources are clearly more clumped together in the sky. There's more hot pixels and cold pixels relative to the dark matter image. So let's focus on a um, particular area on both of these. So in the dark matter image, what I want to do now is actually just go in this image and count the number of photons that I see in every pixel and just make a histogram of that. Um, so that's here. So number of pixels and photon count. Um, when I do that for a diffuse source like dark matter, there isn't a huge amount of variation from pixel to pixel. Um, so you know, there'll be some pixels with one photon, some with none. You know, not, like I said, not very much variation. It might look something like that. If I do the same exercise now, but um, assuming that the source is these point sources, um, there's going to be more variation. And in particular, I'm going to hit pixels that have a lot more photons in it. And I'm also going to hit pixels that have more, uh, more cold pixels. Right? So if I make this distribution, I'm going to expect to have a tail here at high photon counts and also more, um, 
more pixels that have uh, zero photon counts. So the distribution of photon counts looks different for sources that are diffuse, like dark matter, versus sources that are not diffuse. And you can do this out exactly, fully analytically, and you can see you, what you'd find is that the photon count distribution is Poissonian for diffuse sources, and um, you get the exact non-Poissonian form for it for this case here with the, the, the point sources. So the goal of our analysis is to take advantage of these differences um, to be able to distinguish whether or not the photons in the galactic center look more uh, diffuse or not diffuse. So let me take a step back and explain how the standard searches are the standard um, dark matter searches that have been done at the Galactic Center, um, the approach that they take. So this is uh, often referred to as the template analysis. And what's done is that you start off with um, spatial templates that uh, describe the, just the spatial distribution of the photons you expect from a given source. So for example, here I'm showing two different templates. One is showing the distribution of photons you'd expect for diffuse. Uh, the fuse background, and the other is showing the distribution of photons you'd expect for dark matter distributed according to an NFW profile. What you do next is you choose a pixel, P, and you just count up the number of expected photons for each of these components. So I'd count up the number of photons in this pixel here coming from the diffuse background. That gives me this number. Count up the number here in the NFW dark matter template. That gives me this number. And then summing the two gives me the expected number of photons in a given pixel. And the probability of observing these photons in that pixel is just given by a Poisson distribution. Once I can write down this probability, then I can do likelihood analysis and do best fits and pull out um, you know, how much dark matter is there, et cetera, et cetera. What we're doing that's different is we're adding additional templates that spatially look the same, but that are described by different photon count statistics. So for example here, what I've done is added an additional template that um, would describe NFW point sources. So spatially it looks exactly the same as the NFW dark matter template, but the, the statistics of the, the, the photons in this template is going to be different. It's non-Poissonian versus the statistics in this template. Now, writing down the probability for this is going to be more complicated than just writing down the Poisson distribution. Um, we've described this in, in a lot of detail in our first paper, which was developing formalism that was first developed by Malashev and Hogg a few years back. I'm only going to outline it very, very briefly, which is that you can write down a total generating function for the number of photons in a given pixel. So where one, you know, the, this total generating function is a product of the generating function describing the Poisson fluctuations and the generating function describing the non-Poissonian fluctuations. From this, then you can just following standard procedure, you take this derivative and that allows you to recover the probability of observing K photons in a given pixel. So in the limit where I do not include this template, um, I do not have this term here in the generating function, and when I go here to do this derivative, I recover completely the Poisson distribution. Um, adding in this additional term here complicates it, and then I get um, a different distribution that can properly account for the non-Poissonian fluctuations. All right, so once we can write down that probability, we can do a Bayesian uh, analysis to find the posterior distributions for the free parameters in the model. There's a few parameters that are going to be of particular interest to us today. The first is the normalization of the dark matter component, and the second is the normalization of the point source component. Um, additionally, um, one thing I do want to emphasize is that we are not making any assumptions as to the nature of the sources. Um, this is what we call a point source, is any sub-pixel structure in the map. So it can be a pulsar, it could be a gas clump, it could be a cloud, it could be a dark matter substructure. We're agnostic to it, we don't care. Um, the only assumption that we are making about the point sources is that their source count function is described by a double power law. 
Now I'm going to be showing you a lot of plots that look like this in the next few minutes. So I'm going to start by just showing you a cartoon so you can just gain some intuition for it. When I say source count function, what I mean is just the number of sources in a given pixel that have a flux in a certain range. Um, and so we're assuming that it's a double power law. So the free parameters are just going to be the slope above and below the break, which is just given by FB, and then the overall normalization of this source count function. OK, so these are the templates that get fed into our analysis. We have a template for the diffuse background, a template for the Fermi bubbles, one for isotropic diffuse, and one for NFW dark matter. These, are, these four templates are the ones that have been typically used in the past. The statistics for these four templates are just Poisson statistics. And each one of these just carries its own normalization. So that's the free parameter that we're varying. What's different about our analysis is that we're adding two more templates. We have one here for isotropically distributed point sources. And we have one for NFW distributed point sources. Um, each of these templates carries four free parameters coming from the four free parameters of the source count function. And the reason why we're considering this NFW distributed point sources is because we ultimately want to be able to test whether or not we could be able mistaking a dark matter signal at the galactic center that's distributed like NFW with point sources that are also distributed like NFW. All right, so we start off by doing the analysis at high latitudes. The reason we do this is because um, this area of the sky, there's going to be less uh, contamination from um, the diffuse background. So we can run here and just make sure that our uh, analysis procedure is giving us results that make sense. So we mask third plus or minus 30 degrees around the plane. So we don't look at any of the stuff that's within the gray region. Um, and let's see, the, each dot here, so the little gray dots, each dot is um, masking a, the known location of a Fermi point source. So the uh, current Fermi catalog listing all of their known point sources is called 3FGL. So each one of these is a 3FGL point source um, as identified in the sky. So we do the analysis both masking these point sources and then not masking them. Um, and this is what we find. So there's a lot going in this plot, so let's just take it one step at a time. This is the source count function, so dn, df here, and flux on the horizontal axis. What's shown in the black dots is the source count function of the 3FGL sources that are observed by Fermi in this region of the sky. Um, so you can see that as you go to lower flux, the number of sources increases up to a certain point and then appears to fall off. This fall off is indicating uh, roughly where the threshold is for uh, point source identification. Um, I should mention that everything that I'm plotting here is focusing only on photons in the energy range roughly from 1.9 to 11.9, which is where we expect the, um, the excess to be dominated. OK, so the first thing we do is to uh, run our template analysis um, without masking the three FGL sources. The purpose of doing this is to see whether or not we can just recover all of the point sources that Fermi has already identified. Um, what we find from our best fit is given by the green band here. Uh, and so you can see that we do a very good job at just recovering the right slope um, of the observed population in this region of the sky. The next thing we do is to mask all of the three FGL sources. The purpose of doing that is to see whether or not we can recover additional sources that may not be in the Fermi catalog. When we do that, we find this orange band. Um, so as we would like, the orange band is only showing that there's a contribution below the Fermi threshold. So what we're picking up is um, you know, at these high latitudes, there's likely a population of sources that haven't been identified yet by Fermi, so they're unresolved, and um, we think that they fall roughly uh, in this region here. Now, we can um, use these results to obtain an estimate on the intensity of the uh, isotropic gamma ray background. Our results are consistent with those that have been presented by Fermi in the past. We can also obtain the fraction of extragalactic uh, background due to resolved and unresolved point sources. Again, our results are consistent with those that have previously been considered in the literature. So this gives us confidence that the method is working. 
We also think we can push the method even further in this region of the sky to get some really good measurements of the isotropic gamma ray background. Um, that's a whole separate talk in itself, so I won't have any time to get into that. Um, instead, uh, I'm going to forge ahead to the area of the sky that I promised I would talk about, which is the inner galaxy. So we do the analysis in this region here that's uh, within 30 degrees of the plane. Uh, we mask out plus or minus 2 degrees. So this gray band here, we don't look at anything close to the plane because it's just way too complicated. Um, and the gray dots here are showing, again, the identified three FGL sources in this region of the sky. Um, notice that when we do mask out these three FGL sources, uh, we effectively end up masking within five degrees of the galactic center. Uh, so we're really looking mainly in this inner galaxy region. Okay, so we do our template fitting, our modified template fitting procedure here. And this is the result that we find. So again, source count function here is a function of flux. The black points are the identified three FGL sources in this part of the sky. Um, when we do the analysis without masking these three FGL sources, we find we recover the green band. So we do a nice job, our analysis does a nice job at picking up the identified sources that are already there. And then we repeat the analysis masking all of these sources, and what we find is the orange band. So this is telling us that um, there appears to be evidence for a population of unresolved point sources just below the threshold of uh, the Fermi, of current 3FGL catalog from Fermi. Um, the, the evidence for this is quite strong. Um, you can see just uh, this is roughly 68% confidence. Um, it, you know, it's definitely not zero. Um, and so the next question is, um, in our fit, what fraction of flux is pulled out uh, is accounted for by this point source population relative to the fraction of flux that's accounted for by the dark matter component? Because we've included both in our fitting procedure. Um, and this is the result. So this is showing the posterior distribution of the fraction of flux for these two different components. The blue line is the fraction of flux that's absorbed by the NFW point source template. And the red line is the fraction of flux that's absorbed by the NFW dark matter template. Um, what you can see is that the pretty much no flux is absorbed by the dark matter template. Um, and uh, all the flux is observed absorbed by the point source template. Um, if we, we can repeat the analysis and just remove the point source template, what we find is that in that case, the flux just gets completely reabsorbed by the dark matter component. Um, so essentially, if you put in an NFW template, um, it wants to absorb this, uh, this flux. Um, but if you allow it to distinguish between a point source, non-Poissonian photon count statistics, or Poissonian photon count statistics, it prefers the, um, uh, the non-Poissonian photon count statistics much more. How much more? Uh, well, we can look at the Bayes factor, uh, which compares the likelihood for a model that includes both the dark matter and point source component relative to a model that includes only the dark matter component. The Bayes factor is 10 to the 7. Um, any number greater than 10 would have indicated a strong correlation, uh, sorry, not a strong preference for the um, point source and dark matter model. Um, in terms of numbers, what we predict um, is that the half of the excess can be explained roughly by 60 sources. Um, what that would mean is that in this bin here, the one just below the threshold, um, we expect the sources to be here the number of sources, roughly 60, would put you up here. Um, to account for the entirety of the excess, you would need more like 200 point sources. But um, I don't, that, that, that number should be taken with a huge grain of salt because it requires integrating down to much lower fluxes here where the errors on the source count function start becoming quite large. Okay, we've done numerous cross checks. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the time to really go through most of them. So I'm just going to quickly flip through a few. And then if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to discuss them in more detail afterwards. So like I said, the biggest concern here is uh, the diffuse background. It's the thing that's kept me up at night, wondering whether or not, for some reason, um, this new approach is picking up random fluctuations in the diffuse background over some generally new point source population. 
Um, we've tried a few things here. We've um, first test was just putting in different uh, diffuse models. So the analysis I showed before was using the Fermi P6 V11 model. We've um, redone the analysis with the Fermi P7 V6 model. We recover um, consistent source count function. We've also done, redone the analysis with about 13 additional diffuse models that just vary a whole bunch of different parameters. Um, this is just showing the full spread of what we find over those 13 models. Again, um, everything is fairly consistent. Uh, second test, uh, we've looked at other regions of the sky where excesses have been observed. Because one thing you might be worried about is that your analysis might just be picking up um, any fluctuation in the diffuse background and just calling it point sources. So what you want to do is look someplace else where there is an excess and see what you pick up. Um, so we looked at uh, this region on the plane centered at L equals 30 degrees where people had observed an excess in the past. And what we find in this region of the sky is um, shown here. So the orange band shows the uh, source count function um, when all of the three FGL sources are masked. So in this region of the sky where an excess has, another excess has been observed, we don't find any evidence for, uh, for point sources over the dark matter uh, interpretation. And, and actually when you look at the comparison between uh, fractional flux absorbed by NFW point sources versus dark matter. In this case, they're totally consistent with one another. We can't differentiate. Um, okay, I don't have time for that. Um, so the analysis leaves open many uh, questions. Um, and in particular, the source count function that we're recovering has um, several unexpected features. So one argument that had been made for a while about why point sources couldn't explain the excess was that if you look at the luminosity function of the observed uh, pulsars, millisecond pulsars in the Milky Way, they tended to overpredict the number of sources you would get in the, uh, in the galactic center. And so this is illustrated here. So the red line here is showing what you would have expected to see if the, the luminosity function of these sources was the same as that of the observed millisecond pulsars. So the solid red and the dashed red um, same thing except with different cutoffs in luminosity. The important point is that they tend to give you um, predictions for sources that are above the threshold. So this was the usual argument of, you know, this luminosity function would tend to overpredict the sources that we would have seen. Um, you can use the same luminosity function, but with a lower cut on the threshold, you get this dotted red line. Um, this would predict that you would expect to see something like a thousand point sources in this region of the sky, which seemed like a lot. Um, so what we're saying is that this is probably order 100 sources can account for the excess. And the reason that our result is different than what people had been saying in the past was essentially because the source count function is different. Um, we're get finding that most of these sources should actually be living pretty close to the, right below the, the threshold. All right, so to conclude, um, I hope I've been able to illustrate that uh, the use of photon count statistics provides a concrete way of determining whether the photon distribution is non-Poissonian. Um, we've taken advantage of this um, and developed a template fit procedure that can include non-Poissonian components. Um, and we verify that this procedure works at high latitudes. Um, and then applying the same procedure in the inner galaxy, we find evidence for subpixel structure, which would not be indicative of a dark matter signal. Um, little asterisk here, so at the same day that our paper came out, um, an accompanying paper uh, came out by uh, this group here, used a very different type of analysis method, um, but also came, with, came up with a similar conclusion um, for this additional structure. Um, so I just want to end with this slide here, which I think should summarize the next steps that we're hoping to, to pursue. So what this is showing is the inner galaxy region. Um, each of these being the individual pixels. Um, the color of each pixel tells us the probability that that pixel contains a point source. So the brighter the pixel, the more likely it is to contain one of these point sources. Um, you can see that most of the red pixels here have a, a white circle around them. The white circles are the identified three FGL sources, so we do a good job of picking those up. What we hope to do um, in our next analysis is to provide the locations of the sky that are most likely to contain the non-Poissonian sources. Um, 
the, sorry, the, the locations in the sky that are most likely to contain the unresolved point sources uh, that we're finding, as well as the uh, energy spectra for each of those sources. So the hope is that um, we should be able to um, combine this with information from other wa multi, uh, wavelength analyses to uh, really be able to get at the heart as to what exactly the nature of these sources is. Thank you. Time for a couple of questions. Thanks. It was probably on your list of things you checked, but I just was curious about um, how sensitive your results are to the form of the source count function you choose to choose to a two power law. Uh, yeah. So. Um, I will just flip. Here we go. So we this is a first attempt at doing this. Um, we're hoping to be able to do this more carefully in our follow-up analysis. But we could try binning um, as opposed to just making an assumption of a double power law. And um, I can I can talk to you about this in more detail later. But essentially, the results are consistent. And we're hoping that in the next uh, uh, paper that we put out, we'll be able to decrease the error bars on this and, and take, properly take into account the correlation between the bins. But with this first pass, it does look like um, the results are consistent with the, the source count function we seem to. Uh, so, so, so very, very naively, um, why do you need at all these templates for the point sources? Why don't you just uh, strongly rule out statistics, the, the Poissonian distribution of the, of the gamma rays, of the photons? I mean, you simply have many photons and uh, you can check whether they are consistent with a, with a smooth distribution, as you expect from dark matter. And according to what you said, I would have thought that you find a many sigma exclusion of that hypothesis. Um, so what, sorry, I guess what I don't understand about your question is what would be the statistic that you want to, do you want to just look by eye to see whether or not there's a, that the photons are clumpy? No, I thought if you have, you have whatever 10,000 photons in a certain region. Yeah. And you have a hypothesis that they are uh, Poisson distributed. And you look, for example, at the correlation function of two photons, of pairs of photons. Oh, to, you mean to... to and you, ju you just, you just say that they are not, they are not, I mean, you, are, you just exclude the hypothesis of a, sm of a smooth distribution. Isn't that a statistically well-defined question? Um, Independently of, of the distribution that actually is there. Yeah, so you, you can do a two-point correlation. Essentially what we're doing is a one-point correlation. Um, you can do a two-point correlation. Uh, that should work. What we found is that the template analysis helped give us um, a better handle on um, being able to properly subtract out the diffuse background. Because the diffuse background is sort of the, the challenge in, in everything. And so the, by including the spatial information, um, it helped us to, to reduce that, the, to eliminate the background in a way that was, uh, we felt robust and um, so that we could uh, increase the sensitivity to the point sources. But yeah, the, the point about doing two-point correlations is an interesting one and one that we definitely want to explore in some more, more detail because there's probably more information that's coming from that. Yeah. Time to break for lunch, uh, so let's uh, thank the speaker again.